<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the Sarepta Therapeutics third quarter 2023 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hands raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'll turn the call over to Francesca Nolan, Executive Director, Investor Relations and Corporate Communications. Please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for joining today's call. Earlier this afternoon, we released our financial results for the third quarter of 2023. The press release is available on our website at Sarepta.com, and our 10Q was filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission this afternoon. Joining us on the call today are Doug Ingram, Ian Estepan, Dallin Murray, and Dr. Louisa Rodino claypack After our formal remarks, we'll open the call for Q&A. I'd like to note that during this call, we will be making a number of forward-looking statements. Please take a moment to review our slide on the webcast, which contains our forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties, many of which are beyond Sarepta's control. Actual results could materially differ from these forward-looking statements, and any such risks can materially and adversely affect the business, the results of operations, and trading prices for Sarepta's common stock. For a detailed description of applicable risks and uncertainties, we encourage you to review the company's most recent quarterly report on Form 10-Q filed with the SEC, as well as the company's other SEC filings. The company does not undertake any obligation to publicly update its forward-looking statements, including any financial projections provided today based on subsequent events or circumstances. And now I'll turn the call over to our president and CEO, Doug Ingram, who will provide an overview of our recent progress. Doug? Thank you, Fran. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Sarepta Therapeutics third quarter 2023 financial results conference call. It was only two days ago that we announced the results of our double-blind placebo-controlled trial Embark. Therefore, I will not linger on the results here, but I will begin by summarizing Sarepta's perspective. First, taken as a whole, the results of Embark confirm that Elevitas stabilizes muscles, slows or entirely arrests decline, does so across the ages, and does so with a laudable safety profile not shared by other programs for Duchenne. Second, the Embark results have not only satisfied the confirmatory requirements for our June approval, but have shown that Elevitas benefits patients across age groups consistent with its mechanism of action. Hence, we will soon be submitting a BLA supplement to broaden the Elevitas label to remove age and ambulation restrictions. <clears throat> and finally, we have already engaged in productive and encouraging discussions with FDA, and they have confirmed that they are committed to reviewing an application to broaden the label and are committed to doing so rapidly. Now let me comment on quarterly performance. The third quarter was a defining moment for Sarepta. We launched our fourth therapy and the first gene therapy for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We continued to drive great performance with our three PMOs, and importantly, on a non-GAAP basis, we achieved profitability, placing us in ever more rarefied biotech territory. As you will have seen in our release, led by an exceptional launch of Elevitus and continuing performance of our three approved PMOs, Exondus, Myondus, and Amondus, third quarter total revenue came in at $332 million, and total net product revenue stands at $309.32 million, growing 49% over the same quarter last year. Reflecting the team's ability to execute and, to ser and serve Duchenne patients, Elevitas net product revenue came in at $69.11 million, nearly triple mean external consensus. Likewise, our PMOs achieved $240.21 million in net product revenue, growing 
over the same quarter prior year. And non-GAAP earnings stood at $38 million in the quarter, a major milestone for Sarepta as we transitioned to a profitable and in the near term cash flow positive organization. <clears throat> the team has done a tremendous job working with families, physicians, and payers in the quarter, and it shows in these results. Dallin Murray, our Chief Customer Officer, will walk you through what has been nothing short of a remarkable launch of Elevitus. And looking to the near future, we will take our proven track record of execution and move forward rapidly to expand the label of Elevitus so this team can employ that level of execution to make Elevitus available to the majority of Duchenne patients in the United States. Following Dallin's discussion, Dr. Regino Claypack will provide an update on our pipeline progress. Now, as you would expect, we are not providing updated guidance this early in the launch, but also, obviously, across our four approved therapies, we are going to substantially exceed $1 billion this year, another important milestone to be sure. And with that, let me turn the call to Dallin for a commercial update. Dallin? Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon. The launch of Elevitus in the third quarter was Sarepta's fourth Duchenne launch. It was by far the most complex and challenging to date. And I'm proud to say the team was ready on day one, and they have knocked it out of the park thus far. As Doug has mentioned, we generated just over $69 million in net product revenues in the third quarter for Elevitus. Notably, the team exceeded our own lofty site readiness expectations with nearly 70 sites ready to dose today. This helps us support the patients at risk of aging out today and also sets us up for longer term success going forward. We approached this launch by building organically upon what was already best in class Duchenne commercial and medical teams. We put additional responsibility on everyone across the board rather than building out separate gene therapy teams and they have all stepped up magnificently to meet this important moment. Our early success was achieved in three ways. First, flawless execution with our external stakeholders. That is the neuromuscular KOLs, gene therapy sites of care, and the eligible patients they serve. Secondly, proactive payer engagement to expedite access for those patients who are eligible based on the label. And third, establishing a well-functioning, flexible distribution model supported by the Sereptisips team to get each patient's customized kit to the site of care at the right time, just in time for the infusion. I would like to take a moment now to recognize the Duchenne community and how they came together to expedite access for patients who are eligible for Elevitus, led by our doctors, nurses, and other HCPs all stakeholders were ready for this important moment, and it was humbling to see the whole community come together to support eligible patients in their treatment journey. This launch also demonstrated the progress our teams and the experts have made in the past several years, educating the payers about Duchenne. We were gratified by the urgency of payers in expediting policies that allowed access for eligible patients. Additionally, and importantly, the payers played a key role in supporting patients who are at risk of aging out. Saying all of that, we still have much more work to do with some of the payers to achieve our goal of securing access and treatment for all eligible patients across the country, regardless of plan. The team is working diligently as we speak, educating the payers on the robustness of the newly available Embark data. We're confident that this data sets the stage nicely for access to align with our label today, as well as when we gain a broader label. The fast start in Q3 was a function of the team's efforts in the quarter itself, and just as importantly, their efforts over the past seven years building the model which we have established to support all of the Duchenne patients eligible for our therapies. Had this been Sarepta's first launch, our trajectory in the third quarter would have been very different and much slower. We've gained deep knowledge and expertise through three PMO launches, and I'm glad to say we were able to apply these learnings 
to the launch of Elevitus. So to summarize Elevitus, it was a great first quarter for the launch because our team and our key stakeholders were prepared and they executed flawlessly to support the patients we serve. Driven in large part by the robust Elevitus revenue in the third quarter, we grew overall net product revenue by roughly 30% over the prior quarter. Net product revenue in Q3 of 2023 was 309.3 million. Importantly, as Doug said, in addition to our success with Elevitus, we also had our most successful quarter ever serving patients with our established PMO franchise. We see continued opportunities in the U.S. and globally for our PMO business in spite of the fact that we also expect cannibalization from Elevitus over time. Since the four to five population represents far less than 10% of the PMO business in the U.S., this cannibalization will not have a material impact on our 2023 net product revenue. I'd like to take a moment here to thank all of those who are relentlessly supporting our PMO patients. So as a result of the whole team's effort, the net product revenue from our PMO business in Q3 was $240 million, representing a roughly 16% increase over the same quarter in 2022. Looking now at each of our PMOs individually, net product revenue for Exondus 51 was $140 2.3 million in Q3, which was over 16% above the same quarter in 2022. Bionis 53 net product revenue was 31.7 million, 3.4% above Q3 of 2022. And Amondus 45 generated net product revenue of 66.3 million in Q3 of 2023. This represents roughly 21% growth over Q3 of 2022. As we've mentioned in previous calls, we are in the mature phase of the market now for all three of our approved PMOs. As a result, while we expect the U.S. growth to continue to flatten and the ex-U.S. revenues, while still in the growth phase, to remain lumpy from quarter to quarter and thus difficult to project on a quarterly basis. Taken together, we can reiterate our annual guidance of greater than $925 million in net product revenue for our PMO business in 2023. I'll end by saying that I've been continually amazed and impressed by the resilience, commitment, and execution of our Sarepta teams over the years. And while the success over those years has been impressive, what the teams have achieved in the third quarter of 2023 stands above and beyond anything I've seen in my 10 years working to serve the Duchenne community. The future is bright for Sarepta and for the Duchenne community who have been waiting for and very much deserve this progress. Words can't adequately express just how proud I am of our whole team. The individual stories from across the country are too numerous to mention here, nor can we as a team put into words the joy we feel when we celebrate each and every patient who gains access to any of our dystrophin restoration therapies. And so with that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Louise Rodino claypack Louise. Thanks, Dallin. Our commitment to the science remains steadfast and our goal to change the lives of patients with rare diseases unwavering. Our opportunity to do good is limitless for those living with Duchenne, limb girdle, and many other diseases for which therapies are either inadequate or non-existent. As Doug has already detailed the Embark results, I will focus my comments on the progress of our gene therapy and RNA programs. First, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, or LGMD. We remain committed to advancing our LGMD portfolio across a variety of subtypes and look forward to providing continuous updates on these important programs in the months ahead. We presented on our LGMD pipeline this past weekend at the Speak Foundation's 2023 International LGMD Conference and shared our urgency with the community to bring forth genetic medicines for LGMD. To begin, we made excellent progress for Voyaging, our phase one study evaluating SRP9003 for the treatment of limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2E 
in ambulant adult patients and non-ambulant patients using clinical process SRP9003 material. We are pleased to report that we completed enrollment in Voyaging and we remain on track to initiate our phase three study using commercially representative process material later this year. Combined with positive expression and functional data shared from our initial study, SRP9003101, we believe the data from Voyaging will give us insights into a broader patient population. We are also excited to report that we completed dosing in our systemic pilot study, Navigene, for our SRP6004 dual vector RH74 mediated gene therapy to treat individuals with LGMD2B. LGMD2B is characterized by the absence of the protein dysferlin. The innovative dual vector strategy allows us to deliver the full length dysferlin gene, the sole cause of LGMD2B. We look forward to reporting results from this study in the first half of 2024. As mentioned last quarter, our LGMD natural history study of the sarcoglycanopathies, LGMD2E, 2C, and 2D, called Journey, has been fully enrolled and we will follow patients for 36 months. We continue to make progress in scalable manufacturing for all of our LGMD candidates in our pipeline and look forward to initiating clinical studies as just rapidly as possible. Turning now to the progress we've made with our RNA platform. We were pleased to complete enrollment in the first quarter of 2023 for a momentum study for SRP 5051, and we're targeting readout of the study in 2023. Regarding our post-marketing studies for the PMOs, as mentioned last quarter, we completed enrollment in the ESSENCE trial post-marketing requirement for golodersin and casimersin. As a reminder, Essence is a two-year study and is due to read out in early 2026. Finally, we are pleased to have completed enrollment in our mission study, our dose-ranging post-marketing commitment for Exondus. Mission is a randomized double-blind safety and efficacy dose-finding study comparing the approved dosage of a teplersin at 30 mg per kg weekly to a dosage that provides significantly higher exposure up to 200 mg per kg weekly. Mission is a two-part phase three study and it was fully enrolled in October 2023 with 160 patients enrolled. We remain committed to rapidly and diligently advancing mission and sharing data as soon as it becomes available. We look forward to reporting continued progress with our RNA programs in the coming months. On a personal note, my passion for science and its promise to help others began early in life. These many years later, as I reflect on my career and where we are today in realizing the promise of genetic medicine, I'm grateful and I'm humbled. And yet, we have so much more to do. We move forward from here today toward a more promising future for individuals around the world living with rare disease. In closing, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Serupta team for their continued dedication and passion to patients, the science, and our mission. I'll now turn the call over to Ian for an update on our financial results. Ian. Well said, Luis. Good afternoon, everyone. This afternoon's financial results press release provided details for the third quarter of 2023 on a non-GAAP basis as well as a GAAP basis. Please refer to our press release available on Srepta's website for full reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial results. We're obviously quite pleased with the financial results for this quarter. On the back of a tremendous start for the Exondus launch, we actually achieved non-GAAP profitability. And assuming uh, an expansion to the label to the broader Duchenne population, we should achieve sustained profitability. We're quite thrilled to achieve this milestone just in the first quarter of the launch. For the three months ended September 30th, 2023, the company recorded total revenues of $331.8 million dollars which consists of net product revenues and collaboration revenues compared to revenues of $230.3 million for the same period of 2022, an increase of $101.5 million. Net product revenue for the third quarter of 2023 from Elevitus was $69.1 million. Net product revenue for the same period from our Exxon skipping franchise was $240.2 million compared to $207.8 million for the same period of 2022. For the quarter, individual net product sales were $142.3 million for Exondus 51, $66.3 million for Amandus 45, 
and $31.7 million for Vion is 53. The increase in net product re revenue primarily reflects increasing demand for our PMO products, as well as net product revenue associated with the sales of Elevative. In each of the quarters ended September 30th, 2023 and 2022, we recognized $22.5 million of collaboration revenue, which relates to our collaboration arrangement with Roche. The reimbursement of co-development costs under the Roche Agreement totaled $34.9 million for the third quarter of 2023, compared to $22 million for the same period of 2022. On a gap basis, we reported a net loss of $40.9 million, or $0.46 cents per basic and diluted share, and $257.7 million, or $2.94 per basic and diluted share, for the third quarter of 2023 and 2022, respectively. We reported a non-GAAP net income of $37.7 million or $0.37 cents per, per diluted share in the third quarter of 2023, compared to a non-GAAP net loss of $70 million or $0.80 cents per diluted share in the third quarter of 2022. In the third quarter of 2023, we recorded approximately $37 million in the cost of sales, compared to $40 million for the same period of 2022. The decrease in cost of sale primarily reflects write-off for certain batches of our PMO products not meeting our quality specifications in the three months ended September 30th, 2022, with no similar activity for the same period of 2023, partially offset by increasing demand for our PMO products. On a gap basis, we recorded $194.3 million and $216.7 million in R&D expenses for the third quarter of 2023 and 2022, respectively a year-over-year -year decrease of $22.4 million. The decrease is primarily due to a decrease in our manufacturing expenses, partially offset by increases in clinical trial expenses. On a non-GAAP basis, R&D expenses were $163.9 million for the third quarter of 2023, compared to $193.7 million for the same period of 2022, a decrease of $29.8 million. Now, turning to SGNA on a gap basis, we recorded approximately $120.9 million and $104.8 million of expenses for the third quarter of 2023 and 2022, respectively, an increase of $16.1 million. The increase was driven primarily by an increase in professional services and compensation and other personnel expenses, partially offset by a decrease in stock-based compensation. On a non-GAAP basis, the SGNA expenses were $92.8 million for the third quarter of 2023, compared to $66.8 million for the same period of 2022, an increase of $26 million. On a GAAP basis, we recorded $12.3 million in other expense net for the third quarter of 2023, compared to $400,000 in other income net for the same period of 2022. The change is primarily due to the impairment of our investment and loss on contingent consideration, net partially offset by increases in increasing of an investment discount, net and increases in interest income due to the investment mix of our investment portfolio, as well as reductions of interest expense incurred as a result of the repayment of our December 2019 term loan during 2022. We had approximately $1.8 billion in cash, cash equivalents, investments, and long-term restricted cash as of September 30th, 2023. We're obviously pleased with the amount of capital on our balance sheet, but in turbulent markets, we know cash becomes even more valuable. We continually evaluate our expenses. That said, based on the Embark results and the information we have today, there's no better use of our cash than to build inventory to serve those with DMD. So with that, I'll turn the call over to Doug to start Q&A. Doug? Thank you very much, Ian. Michelle, let's open the call for questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. And please limit to one question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. <clears throat> The first question comes from Manu Panorama with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking the question. Um, just going back to the Embark results, we've gotten this question. If, if you guys adjust for multiplicity, multiplicity on your key functional secondary endpoints, would you still have statistically significant outcomes on these key measures? Thanks so much. 
Yeah, thank you for that question, Anupam. I will turn this call over to Luis. Thank you. Uh, we actually performed a, a global statistical test, and we did this to, to do just that, to test for multiplicity and show that the secondaries do not hit significant just by chance. And so we essentially tested NSAA combined with the secondaries and showed that they were, in fact, statistically significant. So this is a quantitative way to test the totality of evidence in, in respect. So if you think of the forest plot that we showed on our call, that's essentially a statistical test to show that together uh, we see that these are statistically significant. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Tazine Ahmad with Bank of America Securities. Your line is open. Hi guys, good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, you know, for me, I think one of the most popular inbounds I've been getting in the last two days is just trying to triangulate timing. So Doug, to the extent that you can provide us color with what steps are involved next in order to complete your filing, and is there any kind of precedent for a filing like this on the time it would take the agency to review an application? Could it be this calendar year that this could all be complete, or would it be something more traditional like a six-month review, for example? Thanks. Tazine, thank you for your question. And then let me preface my question by saying I'm probably going to frustrate you by not giving hard and fast timelines, other than we're going to move rapidly and we have a commitment from the division to move rapidly as well. Our goal is to file a BLA supplement. I believe it's an efficacy supplement, and we're going to do that very soon. The team is working on it right now. I don't want to commit to the exact date, but, but very, very soon that will be um, submitted. Um, I think traditionally the agency may have um, six months to review. I, I do not believe, I believe the agency is committed to moving as fast as um, is reasonably possible to review this. And there is precedent for this. You see this in other areas like oncology all the time where you can get uh, for something like this, very fast turnarounds. And of course, remember, this isn't a BLA, but a BLA supplement. So the, the inquiry, while extraordinarily important, is focused. And that focus is on the fundamental question, does the totality of the evidence justify the conclusion that a Levitus is bringing a better life to these patients? And of course, we believe that, um, that, it, that it does, uh, the standard for this is quite clear. It's substantial evidence, looking at the totality of evidence. The statute, uh, statute on this is quite clear. You know, it's, I'm not, I apologize. I don't know what that means because I promise I'm not playing a guitar right now. Um, the statute says, you know, it's very clear. Can one fairly and responsibly conclude that the therapy will have the effect it purports to have? And the regulations are also particularly clear that for life threatening and severely debilitating Ill illnesses, one's like the shed, especially where no sa satisfactory alternative therapy exists, um, the FDA has determined that it is appropriate to exercise the broadest flexibility in, in applying the statutory standards. And as Louise just pointed out to everybody, um, not only are the, 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 the evidence um, on whole very compelling, that Elevitus is arresting the decline in these uh, patients. But if you do the actual statistics and look across the primary and our functional secondaries, you can see statistically uh, adjusting for any risk of a false positive, adjusting for mul multiplicities that is powerfully um, statistically significant. So all of which is to say, winding back to the original question to Zine, um, that we're going to we're going to submit a BLA supplement very soon. The agency is very, is committed to working with us very rapidly. And while I won't give an exact timeline, I am confident that we're going to move quickly to review this and if successful, broaden this label. Okay, thanks, Doug. Please Thank stand by much, for the next question. The next question comes from. 
Jenna Wang with Barclays. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my questions. Maybe just follow uh, this comment. Uh, Doug, will you announce when BLA efficacy supplement was accepted? And in the data package, uh, can you lay out what kind of uh, data will be included you know, in addition to what you share with us? Would that also be like, say, the protein correlation you know, of the protein level versus function? Uh, will these data also will be in included? in the package? There, there will be certainly more in the package than, than the top line. We're still evaluating other information, including, you know, for instance, you know, protein and, um, and other things, CK and the like. But, but obviously the focus of the, um, the review is going to be, um, you know, first and foremost, the efficacy and the safety uh, for this therapy. And then, of course, it's all going to be evaluated um, in relation to our request to broaden this label by removing age limitations and, and ambula ambulation um, limitations on that. Um, you know, we, I don't think we've made any final decisions about, you know, what we're announcing uh, during this process, but obviously, generally speaking, we tend to be pretty transparent with folks. Thank you. Please stand by you, for the next question. The next question comes from Colin Bristow with UBS. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon, and, and congrats on the uh, the impressive and evidence sales. Um, maybe another one on the Embark data. Can you speak to the the interpatient variability you saw in Elevidus treated patients? You know, a, a sort of a question we've been getting is: you, Were the positive results driven by a small group of high responders? And maybe if you could also comment on how this variability compared to the phase two experience, that would be helpful. Thanks. Sure. I, I'm going to um, flip this over to Louise to answer specifically. But I would generally know that the positive results, the p-value on these positive results, are they're not close. You know, on the time to rise, it's 0 0.002. On the um, 10 meter walk run, it's 0 0.004. On the global statistical analysis, when one looks at the primary and all the secondaries together, it's 0 .004. So it's very, very powerful. Um, but Luis, you know, perhaps you want to answer more specifically on some of the, uh, um, the, the variability issues. Yeah. yeah, generally we did not see uh, variability, high variability amongst the patients. The standard deviation was either at or below what we anticipated from our previous studies that we used to to power and um, embark. So there, we did not see any high variability. Thank you. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Ree Forseth with Guggenheim. Your line is open. Hi, this is Ryan on ProjectJIT. Um, did the top line data provided to the FDA from Embark include information on microdiffusion? I am very sorry, but I, I was unable to hear um, that that answer that question. Can you can you ask it again, perhaps? Yes. Uh, this is Rai on Prodebjit. Um yeah. Did the top line data provided to the FDA on Embark include information on micro? Goodness, I am so sorry, Rai. I heard the beginning, but I don't hear the question itself. I'm. I'm very I think apologetic. he asked. I think he asked if it included data on microdystrophin expression. Uh, will it with the? I, I imagine that we'll have that data available during the review process with the uh, FDA. Yeah. But as Luis has said, um, the expression we're seeing is in is in the hunted range of what we've normally seen. So it's there's nothing nothing unusual about it. In fact, the p value on it is a point zero, many zeros. Um, it's very it's very strongly, um, robustly. Um, um, the, as you would expect, the limit is robustly mixed, Mr. That's the question posed. 
that that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Apologies, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry about that. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Brian Scorney with Baird. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I guess it wasn't something we looked at very closely before, but I'm studying one of how I think time to rise had a had a non-significant difference in favor in treatment, but not that different in terms of magnitude. I think maybe just under half a second difference. If you can tell me if that's right or not. So I know you've talked extensively about the baseline imbalance issue here, and it seems particularly acute in the case of baseline time to rise. But the active arm was 5.1 at baseline and placebo was 3.6. So I was just wondering if you've gone back and looked at making adjustments for baseline imbalances to evaluate the time to rise differences in study 102. And in particular, if the four to five year old subgroup looks the same in 102 as it did in a mark. Yeah, thank you for that question, Brian. I'll turn this to Louise to respond. Um, I'm going to speak generally because what we did was take the inclusion criteria um, that we've generated for Embark and applied it to our previous data when we um, compared it to the external control. And what we found there is a, um, a, a difference when you exclude those patients that would have been ex uh, excluded by that criteria in 102 where you had those rapid decliners. So in that case, we saw uh, a more significant difference, but the, the specific numbers are escaping that right now, but we did do that analysis where we kind of applied the same exclusion criteria and did see a difference. Great, thank you. Yeah, that, maybe just one thing to add in that analysis to Luis's point, we saw a very, we saw a really good consistency between um, what we observed in 102 and what we observed in 301. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Salvine Richter with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, with regard to the regulatory uh, submission, are there formal or regulatory procedures involved with revisiting an accelerated approval after um, the primary endpoint fails and in a confirmatory trial here? And then just any um, preliminary feedback on your data from payers and how that might impact the, the existing label or um, from physicians with regard to how they think about use in patients here. Yeah. Um, again, on, on the first question, I'm not 100% confident I understand the question. Let me be very clear. The standard for confirmation of an accelerated approval is looking at the totality of evidence and determining whether the benefits of that therapy have been confirmed by the entire data set, not just the confirm confirmatory data, but all of the surrounding um, evidence that would exist, including other studies. Um, and I would strongly argue that not only Embark, but all of the supporting um, uh, evidence as well has strongly confirmed the benefits of this therapy. Um, so I, I, I think we're in very good shape there. Um, the focus of our uh, review with this um, division is going to be on the breadth of the expansion of this label. That, I am quite confident, is going to be the review focus. And as relates to that, as you know, our uh, strong view is that having confirmed these results, having confirmed them across patients and looking at the totality of this evidence and looking at the forest plot as an example and looking at the statistical analysis of the forest plot um, adjusted for multiplicities, it is quite clear that this therapy is arresting the decline in these patients and deserves to be made available to the to, um, to patients um, without limitation to age or, or, um, or artificial restrictions around ambulation. Um, as relates to payers, this is uh, additional um, evidence in our armamentarium with payers. Things have gone very well. Dallin and his team, medical affairs, our commercial, uh, our field force, access to reimbursement and the like, have just done a fabulous job supporting the launch of Elevitas. And I hope everyone will agree with me that it shows in our performance this quarter. And um, this um, bolsters 
um, the discussions that the team can have. Now we can, as an example, we now have a really powerful metric that is compelling on the speed with which one should put a kid on, on therapy. So as we, I will remind you, <clears throat> on the time to rise, not only is the p-value, um, I think, 0 0.002, if I am not mistaken, but in time to rise is the single greatest prognosticator of loss of ambulation and a rise time above five seconds, as we've talked about often and is in the literature um, uh, robustly, um, is the single um, greatest predictor of early loss of ambulation. And, um, and Mark has shown that using a levitus reduces the odds of that occurring in a 52-week period by over 90%. So you know, this provides an additional compelling point with uh, payers who, you know, frankly, so far have done a really good job of providing access. But this provides additional um, evidence that it really is important to get kids on this therapy as soon as possible. And I would argue, looking forward to label expansion, it is a compelling argument for why this um, therapy should be, um, the, this label should be expanded as soon as possible as well, so everyone has access to it. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Yair with Mizuo. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking a question. Um, yeah, congrats on the, um, the great quarter for Elevides. Um So I guess my first question is, were those, you know, the patients who were dosed, were those primarily those who were pretty much anticipated um, the approval, uh, the accelerated approval, and they, I guess I'm, you know, more like the, the bolus, and like how many, would you be able to share how many patients are waiting to be dosed in the coming quarter? And just continuing this theme, uh, now that the Embark data is read out, do you have any sense of um, any shift in patients' receptivity to um, the product at all? I know it's early days. Thanks. Yeah, yeah let me answer those questions uh, quickly. Um, first, um, I don't think there will be any shift in the desire for this therapy, I think, um, um, you know, except for patients that are not in the, parents of patients that are not in the four to five year old range, I think are probably even more compelled um, to, to, you know, to want this therapy and are going to wait impatiently as they should be impatient to have this label um, broadened. Uh, we don't share patient numbers. We're going to use as our metric for success and the measure of our success uh, net product revenue, as, we, as we've said. On the issue of sort of bolus or warehousing of patients, there were certainly some number of patients that physicians were um, getting together and gathering to ensure that they could prefer preferentially get dosed before they um, aged out, because the label obviously, as you know, um, restricts the uh, dosing to um, six and below, six and five. Um, but we've had a steady stream of um, the new start forms since the approval. And so, you know, looking forward, we have a steady um, stream of, um, of um, start forms that are working through the process. Um, and, you know, one other thing people have been asked, but I'll say, say it, um, you know, we've done the, the team, Dell and others, has done a brilliant job on site activation. You know, I think our goal, as you know, our goal had aspirationally been to have 50 sites um, ready to, to infuse at launch. And then very aspirationally, we thought perhaps by the end of the year or sometime next year, we could get all the way to 70 sites. Um, but we're at 70 today. So the team has just done a brilliant job um, uh, making, uh, getting sites ready and up and running, and there is a steady stream of um, start forms to work through. Thank you. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Danielle Brill with Raymond James. Your line is open. Hi guys, good afternoon. Thanks so much for the question. Um, Doug, so we spent a lot of time discussing Embark efficacy data. I'd like to uh, switch over to safety. I recall myocarditis mm -hmm. events being discussed at the ADCOM, including one event 
um, that had occurred in Embark at the time. Just curious if there were any additional safety events of this nature that occurred in the study um, or any other SAEs leading to hospitalization. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Danielle. I will turn the call over to Louise to respond. Yeah, we did not see any differences in the types of SAEs or the frequency of those SAEs. That was one of the most um, reassuring things about Embark was the continued safety profile. And now taken together, that's all of the previous trials. We have a large safety database that's consistent among those trials. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Ritu Borrell with TD Cohen. Your line is open. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Doug, could you um, and maybe Dallin walk us through how you see patient numbers for the different scenarios that our regulatory experts suggest could are in play essentially for label expansion? You know, you mentioned 10% of your PMO sales are for 45. You know, those are covered. Um, but how would you segment it by? maybe six to seven year olds if FDA wants to go down that route again um, and how that number would change if you do got the full ambulatory population, which per my calls now extends to like 12 years of age. For, for ambulatory? Yeah, like that, that's, that's the yeah. average age of loss of ambulation now, 12, 13. That may be correct. I'll have Dallin confirm that in a second. Broadly speaking, I mean, look, first of all, I want to be very clear. We're not looking for a label expansion to go from four to fives to four to sevens, and we don't think um, there's any reason scientifically one would be limited to four to sevens given the data. And you've never seen that before. Once the, you know, you've never seen in any other um, uh, label uh, for a Duchenne therapy these sorts of age-related restrictions. But, you know, answering the broadest um, question, um, the, you know, the all ambulatory versus all ambulatory and non-ambulatory is about 50%. So there's, so the ambulatory population is about half of all patients and then non-ambulatory is the other half, of course. Um, and so that, to our mind, is the, is the big cut. But Dallin, is there anything else you'd like to say on this topic? No, I think you covered it, Doug. Our our goal is to you know target all, all the patients that we can get in the entire population. Uh, Ritu, to your question about average age of loss of ambulation, I think you're in the right range. But, but the KOLs have been talking a lot about you know the definition of loss of ambulation too, because as you know, there's heterogeneity. So you'll you have some patients walking at much older ages, and we have a whole cohort of patients. Uh, who've been treated with the PMOs for years now that are going to, we believe, have uh, uh, older ages of loss of ambulation as well. So it won't be, we believe, you know, the ambulatory population won't be defined by age. But as Doug said, our aspiration is uh, uh, a broad label and uh, targeting all of the patients uh, who, who will be eligible. And is that 50% of your PMO sales too? Hmm. On, uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, the ambulatory versus non-ambulatory split. It, mm -hmm. I think it's in in that range of of uh, fifty percent. I think the access is more difficult in the older patients. So uh, so on average, we've got a higher penetration in the younger ambulant population. Great, thank you. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Mike Alls with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking the question. Um, you mentioned now that you have about 70 sites are active. Can you give us a sense of what percentage of those sites have actually prescribed Elevitus so far? Thanks. Now, we are going to – apologies, I'm going to frustrate you. We're going to resist the, that um, level of detail either on – Numbers of sites are infused or, you know, probably more specifically, number of patients infused at any one time, as we have done for the last seven years. 
Um, and I think we've done you know, generally over time to good success with folks. We use um, net product revenue as the marker for success and uptake and the like. So apologies for that, Mike. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Tim Lugo with William Blair. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier in the week that you didn't expect an additional advisory committee for broadening the, the label, but um, you know we can all remember when we didn't expect one for the accelerated approval discussion. Uh -huh. uh, I guess why not request an AGCOM? It seems like listening to the AGCOM, the participants were much more amenable to a non-age restricted approval than the agency was. Yeah. It, okay, so it's a good question and I, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised by the comment. I, there are those that might say that I have a, I have a poor historical track record of predicting AGCOMs. Notwithstanding the fact that the last time I said it, I, we weren't going to have an outcome, I did have that in writing. Um, the reason that we don't believe we're, we're going to have an outcome is that we don't believe that we will need one. Um, and I think that, you know, I believe as we sit here today, that that is a view that would be shared by us and FDA leadership. As we've said before, um, we had a very productive and encouraging um, discussion with the um, uh, FDA leadership um, on the data and on the possibility of submitting it for um, a broad label. And um, I would also note that you know the the agency has uh, changed. The division, in particular, has gone through some pretty significant changes over the course of this year. There's been a reorganization. Um, just to remind you, where OTAC. Um, has been replaced by this super office OTP. And not too long ago, a new leader, Dr. Nicole Verdun, um, took the helm as the head of OTP. So um, I would say, you know, just you know, that we're not to remember that the, the division is, um, is uh, evolving. Um, obviously, in the event that there was an advisory committee, we would be well prepared for it. And I believe we would perform exceptionally well there. I think Dr. Medina Claypack and team just did a fabulous job representing us. And as one may recall, we did ultimately win that adcom. But as we sit here today, we feel pretty confident that um, we can get a label expansion without an advisory committee. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Gil Blum with Needham & Company. Your line is open. Good afternoon and congratulations on all the progress. Uh, going back to a question, uh, a follow-up on Colin's earlier question about 20 questions ago. So uh, PTR study 102, is there any chance uh, that there would be some follow-up, especially on the patients that were older and were crossed over in part two of study 102 regarding time to rise? It would just be interesting to see how that data looks in comparison to the Embark data. Thanks. Sure. Luis, your thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. All the 102 patients are continued to follow for up to five years, so that's certainly something that we can look at over time. We don't have that data in hand, so we can, can look at that. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Brian Abrahams with RBC Capital. Your line is open. Hi there. Uh, congrats on the strong first full quarter of the Elevitas launch. Thanks for taking my question. Can you remind us of the protocols in place in Embark to protect against functional unblinding? Was this a topic that ever came up with the FDA in your recent discussions? And might you expect any differences in the effect functional unblinding, if there was any, might have on time tests versus on NSAA? Thanks. Yeah, I, I can you know, allow Luis to discuss the protocol aspects of um, 
the blinding process, which was exceptionally rigorous. Um, I, we can, you know, we can generally assume that if, you know, that of these a very objective time tests would be less subject to, you know, any kind of influence in the event there was an unblinding. But um, I would say also that I think the the protocol was um, very good about the blinding process and the, the study itself, one should remember, was actually very well run. I want to be clear about that. But Luis, any thoughts on the blinding process? Yeah, I'm yeah, just specifically so the um Patients and caregivers obviously blinded the PIs as well as the um, the te uh, physical therapists doing the functional tests are all completely blinded. So the studies maintain blinded. Study staff that SREPT is blinded is maintained by a third party. So there's a rigorous process in place to make sure that the, the blind remains intact. That's helpful. Thank you. Please stand by for the next question. The next question comes from Kristen Kluska with Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Jason Bouvier on for Kristen Kluska. Uh, thank you for taking our question and congrats on the strong quarter for Elevitas. Uh, one question um, from us, the cadence of treating patients is going um, faster than the original timelines you laid out. So we're just wondering what the biggest drivers are there. Uh, and how might this also impact the potentially broader launch next year? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to take the question even though Dallin wants to because I want to brag about our team. I mean, I think there's two significant reasons why the cadence of this launch is going exceptionally well and why this launch is, a, from my perspective, an unprecedented success in gene therapy. The first of which, of course, is the therapy itself. This Levitus is a extraordinarily needed therapy that, you know, patients who have been on it and families that share their experience with it are strongly of the belief that they need this therapy and these kids have been stabilized and are doing things um, age-specific that um, untreated kids haven't uh, been able to do. And then, you know, to, to, if you don't mind me bragging a little bit about the team, I mean, this is um, an example of exceptionally great execution by the Sarepta folks led by Dallin as our chief commercial, uh, customer officer. Um, by going beyond that, this is our manufacturing and distribution folks um, as well, you know, just a, a large team effort to execute on this. Uh, and this isn't new for us. I want to remind everyone now that we have now four therapies that we have launched. Every one of those therapies and their launches have gone exceptionally well. I mean, if we look at the PMOs, just to, to, to digress for a moment, I mean, we are now from our first PMO that was approved in late 2016, we're still growing. We grew at 16% quarter over the same quarter of last year, even as we're launching Elevitas and doing brilliantly there. So I think there's a combination both of a great therapy as all of our four therapies, I believe, have been, and exceptional, focused, granular, um, uh, well-informed execution. And what does this mean for the future? It means that we're going, we know how to serve the Duchenne community. Um, and it, and you know, one of the things that excites us about a broader label is we'll be able to bring a levitus to the majority of children and men um, and young men in the United States that are living with and degenerating irreparably from this ferocious disease. And so uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity to bring this therapy to more patients, um, even as we're doing really well with the launch right now. Thank you very much for your question. Please stand by for the next question. The last question comes from Joseph Schwartz with Delirium Partners. Your line is open. Uh, great. Thanks very much for fitting me in. Uh, I was wondering, how are you thinking about upcoming clinical data for a different gene therapy candidate, which we'll have an interim look soon? Is there anything that you'll be focused on in particular, and how do you see the trade-off between safety and efficacy 
if it were able to produce a greater impact on NSAA, how would that impact your relative value proposition for Levitus? Oh, uh, thank you for the question. Look, you know, as I've said many times before, we have in front of us an exceptionally ferocious competitor, and that's Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And all of our focus and all of our energy is in beating this um, damn disease. And I think this team is doing a brilliant job of that. Um, we're exceptionally pleased with the performance of Elevitus. You know, there were some, you know, many years ago, people made decisions about constructs and capsids and the like. And with the benefit of many years of experience, we are exceptionally proud of and, and frankly, nothing less than thrilled with the particular capsid and construct that we have. It's shown not only um, that it is able to, you know, intervene, protect these muscles of these, these uh, children and arrest the decline, but that it can do that with a particularly laudable safety profile given the amount of therapy required here and the fact that it's full body infusions. R874 has been a standout. And we're you know, quite confident that um, anyone who was rational, who had an opportunity to make a decision today about what capsid they would use and what construct they would develop, I'm sure they would do their best to, to uh, try to copy us. So we're, we're not focused on any competitor besides Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we are fer ferociously committed to beating this disease. So that's our, that's our, um, our focus right now. But thank you very much for your question. I would now like to turn the call back over to Doug for closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, and thanks everyone for attending tonight, and thank you for your very thoughtful questions. Uh, let me summarize. This quarter has been an extraordinarily important one. With our fourth approve, uh, approval, we launched the Levitus, and in my opinion, we launched it brilliantly. We have continued to serve the community with our PMOs, which continue robust growth, even in the face of an Levitus launch. And on a non-GAAP basis, we are now profitable, and we are marching toward a cash positive cash flow positive in the very near future. We have built a strong, enduring organization that is focused on two major things. The first is serving our patient community through brilliant science, and the second is executing and getting things done. And that is precisely what we will be doing over the coming months. We intend to continue our strong performance and commitment to serving this community. We intend to move with speed to submit our efficacy supplement and conclude the review on the, broad, on the broadening of the Elevitus label. And when our label has been updated to remove age and ambulation restrictions, we intend to bring this therapy to the majority of patients living with Duchenne in the United States. And with that, I look forward to updating all of you on our progress along the way and have a lovely evening. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.